Um, the first uh, item on the agenda is the executive director's report in lieu of the fact that um, Susan is off this week. Our associate general counsel, Lynn Coombs, will be delivering that report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to pinch hit for Susan this week. Uh, I just have three announcements to make. The first announcement is that our meeting next Wednesday, August 14th, will be canceled. Um, so we will not be meeting here. Uh, the following week, we will be starting our hospital budget hearings. The first one will begin on August 19th in Castleton. Um, we will also have hearings on the 21st, 23rd, 26th, and 28th. The locations of those hearings do vary, so please check our website for more information. And finally, the last announcement that I'd like to make is that the board will be re releasing its QHP rate review decisions for Blue Cross and MVP sometime later this week, and they will be available on the board's website when they are released. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Lynn. The next item is the, the minutes of Wednesday, July 31st. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, July 31st without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. And the next item is a discussion with Vital. We'd welcome the team down, Mike and company. <laughs> Mike, you can just take it away. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon. Thank you for the time to present this update report. Let me first introduce the panel. Uh, to my right is Andrea and Bob. To my left, you've gotten to know them uh, for, from recent presentations, but a new face up here is Christopher Shank. He's our relatively new director of technology and now relegated to the audience is uh, Frank Harris, our strategic technological advisor, who has promised me that he would stay at least until I leave, so <laughs> he will be here. Also, she hasn't arrived yet, she had an HIE steering committee meeting, but Carolyn Stone is our director of operations. She will be joining us in the audience. She's an integral part of uh, the vital operations, and and anything you, you need to know about operations, Carolyn is the person uh, to talk to. I just want to take so a moment. Most importantly, would you put Chris through a proper initiation? Uh, well, that's still ongoing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I've mellowed in my, uh, in my older years here. Um, I just wanted to take a moment of your time to s sort of reflect upon where this organization has been, where we are now, and where we are going. Uh, over the course of the last few years, this organization has done a number of things. First, it's reduced its state funding significantly, while at the same time meeting all of our deliverables uh, that we were assigned in our various contracts. We cut costs by reducing staff and benefits, mostly at the executive and administrative level. And we spent time uh, through technology planning and through initiatives spearheaded by DIVA of tapping the brakes a little bit on our technology spend in order to seek ways to um, spend more effectively and efficiently, such as the collective services project that Christopher will discuss in a few minutes. Of course, during this time, we have, and I, I want to take a moment here, we have really pushed existing staff hard to make um, sure these necessary changes were implemented. And, and you know, they could have said, you know, we're out of here. Uh, the demands are too great, the sacrifices are too many, but they didn't. Instead, they dedicated themselves to making this organization better. And if you ask me what I'm most proud about during my short stint here at Vital, it is the dedication of the staff. Without them, none of the, what, the progress that we've made over the last year and a half 
could have been done. A few years ago, you'll remember, uh, or some of you will remember, um, we had only six days of cash on hand. Uh, today, cash on hand is approximately 180 days. Um, Bob will go over the finances in a minute. We built cash for two specific reasons, but there's another reason as well that I'll discuss in a minute, but for two specific reasons that we are now utilizing. First is to cover an operational shortfall, and to cover any operational shortfalls. Our three-year budget plan uh, called for us using approximately $180,000 of cash surplus in this fiscal year. Um, so we'll be utilizing some of those cash reserves for that. Second, for cash flow purposes, we need to cover gaps between the need to cover expenses and when revenues come in for those expenses. For example, VITAL is now covering the expenses of the implementation of the collaborative services project before the expected revenues are received. We expect to spend approximately 1.2 to 1.5 million of cash over the next four months before we can deliver the operationalized products. And we are funding and our funding for uh, those deliverables will be through a new state contract. Um, in terms of other funding, we've started with discussions of the new 2020 state contract with the state of Vermont through DEVA, and we will begin 2020 contract, contract discussions with other entities as well, um, probably in this month and next month. We are in discussions with other entities about expanding revenue opportunities. We think there are some significant opportunities out there for additional revenues. This, by the way, we will have to use some of our cash in order to ramp up um, the delivery of these services in the future until that revenue flows in. Um, I don't have any specifics on it because that still is sort of in the planning stages on what we're doing, but in November we should have a more clear we should have more clarity in terms of those revenue opportunities that we are pursuing. Also, the legislature extended the funding, as you know, the legislature extended the funding mechanism for vital for two years instead of the normal one year that a, that a misguided Secretary of Administration put in uh, a long time ago. Um, the next few years are filled with exciting possibilities for the VHI and vital, especially with phase one of the collaborative services project underway and phase two in the planning stages as we uh, move forward. We're going to be, you're going to be talking about a new consent policy, which you'll hear an update on later on, and the possibility of expansion of services to assist in healthcare reform in this state. Of course, I will see the start of some of these projects, but not their conclusion. Uh, new leadership will take vital to the next level of success. So let me update you on where we are in the search process for a new president and CEO. We have just closed the time period for the submission of resumes. We had a robust response, is how I would characterize it. The board's executive search committee will begin reviewing those res resumes shortly. I expect interviews to begin in September or October with the final selection targeted for the end of November or start of December. Uh, start date is expected to be on or before January 1st. So I know, I, I have one more meeting, so I'm not going to say goodbye. I have one more meeting, uh, check-in meeting to say uh, uh, before you in November. At least that you know of. Yeah, at least that I know of. Um, so I know I've covered quite a bit in just the introduction. Um, are there any questions before I turn it over to Bob? You're safe. Thank you, Mike. Good afternoon. I'm Bob Trineau, CFO of Vital. I'll be discussing uh, Vital's year-end FY19 financials. We should note that these are unaudited numbers for FY19. They can and will change during the course of the preparation of our audit, um, of which the field work is slated to begin uh, late October with the conclusion um, in 
uh, time for our November review uh, for the Green Mountain Care Board. So moving on uh, to revenue. Our revenue is essentially on budget within a tenth of a percent of what we budgeted for the year. Um, we completed 49 interfaces for our CY19 contract, which began in January. Um, we still have another 40 left to go, but we have done a yeoman's job of uh, completing uh, these projects, uh, which are essential for uh, ensuring connection between healthcare organizations and the VHI. In addition, we delivered data access for laboratory radiology and transcribed reports to 17 ECOs, uh, excuse me, HCOs. Um, that's out of a total of 24 in our CY19 contract, along with increasing connectivity um, by helping 10 HCOs meet uh, tier two standards, which are a, a more robust uh, connectivity standard. Um, we, just to roll back, we successfully completed our requirements for the FY19 extension, and that was from July through uh, December of uh, 2018. That was part of the FY19 extension. Um, it should be noted that the completion of our contractual requirements required substantial effort, as Mike said, from staff and focused support from several contractors. Moving on to expenses, uh, VITAL was below plan by around $800,000 or 14%. This was due primarily to vacancies in the administration and technology teams. Uh, we are filling those positions as we speak. Um, moving on, we also had reduced consulting co costs, and this was due to a change in the recruitment process or the methodology for the CEO that um, saved vital some cost um, by changing the approach. We also had reduced costs from Health Catalyst and if the Green Mountain Care Board remembers, Health Catalyst is form, was formerly known as Medicity. Um, it was acquired by Health Catalyst back in July of 2018. Um, there, the expenses for interface work um, were reduced. We were able to consolidate several interface projects and save uh, some money in that uh, cost element. Uh, we also had no need for a contingency, if you'll recall. Our budget had $100,000 uh, for a contingency uh, to cover any unknowns that we hadn't included in the budget. And fortunately, we did not need to um, utilize that. And finally, as Mike had mentioned, um, we had a pause or a tapping of the brakes, as Mike likes to say, on technology spend in order for us to evaluate our technology projects and whether they could be incorporated in the overarching collective, uh, sorry, collaborative services um, project. For instance, we had about 140,000 for MPI improvement in our FY19 budget. That's just shifted into FY20 and is part of the overall collaborative services projects. Um, our balance sheet remains strong. Uh, cash on hand, as Mike said, is 180 days. Um, our liabilities are very manageable with our current financial resources. The quick ratio for year-end FY19 is 7.8. So essentially, we can cover our current our liabilities with our quick assets, which are cash and receivables, by eight times. This positions us well to support the financial requirements of the new collaborative services project, along with meeting the reduced funding in FY20, and also the development of new revenue sources that we'll need to um, continue our, us on our path of sustainability. So that, that is the sum of my presentation this afternoon. If there are any questions, from the Green Mountain Care Board. 
Any questions? Maureen? Um, yeah, just a couple of questions. On the information technology, the 432 favorability, you've talked about some of that moving into the next year. Will those be overages to the 1920, or that you're, are you covering them in your current forecast? Um, I think some will be overages, and because they had originally been um, scheduled in terms of implementation in FY19, so the implementation cost is, in some instances, a large chunk. Um, but in other cases, the majority of it we've absorbed um, in our FY20 budget. Um, we had planned to do that work and it just carried on. If it didn't happen in FY19, that work just shifted into FY20 under our FY20 budget. As Mike likes to remind me, we have um, kind of the mandate to, to look at FY20 to bring that uh, deficit of 182,000 down to zero by the end of the year. So we will be looking at opportunities within technology and also other um, cost elements uh, to find any other savings that we can achieve. And then um, you've done a good job managing the balance sheet. But AR still seems high relative. I mean, are your terms more like 75 to well, 90 days um, or? That's a, that's a great question because there are two, the AR is made up of two um, large um, invoices. One had been billed um, for May, which was around $660,000. And the other was an unbilled uh, amount for June um, because the way that our cash conversion process happens is that we end the month and we have until the 15th of the next month to, to provide the state with deliverables. The state will review that over a 10 business day period and get back to us with uh, their acceptance. Um, it's a very formal process, um, but it works very well in terms of our um, integration with the state on ensuring that they get exactly what they want um, and when they want it and in the form that they want it. But that, that cash conversion period is anywhere from 55 to 60 days. So what, what you're seeing is the result of two months where we, where we have not been paid for those two months. Now, we have been paid the May um, billing, so it's just a matter of timing. Is there seasonality at the end of your year, too, between billing and... No, I, I think I've always tried in my budget to put two months of receivables um, as into um, our budget. Um, so that's kind of been noted. But to your point, yeah, is there seasonality? Yeah, there, there is because it's the end of the year and, and typically you get two months worth of receivables from the state that are, are unpaid. And um, they paid May, and we expect that they will pay June um, when uh, our invoice is submitted. No, it looks good, but I just wanted a couple questions on that. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions for Robert? Okay, proceed. This is the new back of the district. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Bob. I'm happy to be here today and I'm excited to be working with you. As you know, planning for the Collaborative Services Project has been ongoing for a few months. There has been significant progress since our last update in May. As part of this, excuse me, as part of this project, uh, the shared, shared master patient index uh, is the first step. Vital is leading and will be sharing with Capital Health and OneCare. In May, we indicated that we selected Verado's universal MPI solution pending successful contracting. That contract was signed in June and implementation began last month. For terminology services and interfacing, the collaborative services participants chose to partner with Maine's HIE Health InfoNet. The terminology services solution, called Term Atlas, was created by Health InfoNet and this part of the project will be led by Capital Health. 
The selected interfacing solution is wrapped to be hosted by Health InfoNet. We are currently completing a single contract with Health InfoNet for both services. A new data platform has been added to the Collaborative Services project as a second phase. Vital's efforts with the previously presented future platform has positioned us well for this project. Currently, Vital is leading the collaboration and is working with Capital Health to begin the RFP process. The data platform will be a shared healthcare repository for the Vermont Health Information Exchange, the Vermont Clinical Registry, and the OneCare Data Mart. Importantly, this platform will be available for additional partners in the future. We look forward to continue sharing our progress of the Collaborative Services Project. <clears throat> now I'd like to move on to data security. At VITAL, security is our top priority. <clears throat> We'd like to share just a few of our enhancements over the last six months. During the months of February and March, we completed one of our regularly scheduled comprehensive vulnerability scans, raised the bar of our security framework, and collaborated with the Agency of Digital Services through an extensive technology review. In April and May, we began encrypting our email, enhanced the protections of VITAL's internal data files, and implemented improvements suggested by the ADS technology review. Finally, over the last two months, we established a process of managing vendor risk through security assessments, are completing the implementation of off-site backups for our data center, began developing a business continuity plan, and submitted an RFP to several vendors for managed security information and event monitoring systems. As the security at VITAL enhances, our progress will continue to be shared. Does anybody have any questions? Questions? Boy, we're letting the new guy off pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Andrew? Thanks, Christopher. We have some metrics to share with you for the month ending June. Vital's dedicated, the Vital team has dedicated almost 600 hours to meaningful use and security risk assessment consultations. This work is primarily focused on improving the data quality of uh, information entered into electronic health records, as well as assisting healthcare organizations and providers in their efforts to, to qualify for the electronic health record incentive payments. Our quota for each month is 80 hours, just as a reference point. The percent of Vermont patients providing consent continues to Increase. We did hit our target rate of 42% at the end of May, and we'll continue to provide you updates as time goes on. Regarding connectivity criteria and more um, mostly focused around work plans, we have a target of 89 work plans to be completed by the end of this calendar year. Currently, there have been 59 completed, and there are 63 in progress. So we are anticipating that we'll be well above the 89 by the end of this year. Something we're really excited about are the um, number of locations meeting Tier 2 connectivity criteria. We have 10 locations that currently met that threshold, which is really exciting, and that really means that the organizations are capturing common data elements and those elements are being transmitted to the VHI. Moving on to point of care utilization. In our efforts to expand access to data as well as improve utilization, there were 3,072 queries or 27 queries at the end of June for the web-based vital access provider portal. This is actually almost double of what it was at this time last year. Moving down to the red and purple, cross-community access as well as single sign-on are the newer ways to access information, and those are incrementally improving as well. Provider results delivery. At the end of June, over 100,000 lab results, radiology reports, and transcribed reports were delivered to 448 providers. 
and there is a, a little over 740,000 total messages for the beginning uh, from the get January of this year. And that's all I have for updates. Are there any questions? I'll start it off. What are the reasons that you see for um, a reason why a work plan that's in progress doesn't reach completion? I think it's more of not that it won't reach completion, but of timing. Okay. And that it takes a while to assess the progress. Um, and the engagement of the organization is also important to identify the criteria that's needed. Uh, so far, we've been really, really lucky and, and um, happy with the level of engagement with organizations and their willingness to work with us on identifying the data elements that are needed and then making the, the changes, because it does take time. OK, so it's just a matter of when the calendar year falls. OK. Yes. Questions? Tom. <clears throat> yes, I'm, I'm going back to your percent of Vermont uh, patients providing consent. And I'm looking at the 42% bar that you have here and that threshold which you've crossed. And I'm just wondering um, when we might see a new bar. And I know there's some variability there in terms of uh, the uh, consent process and which way that ends up um, going down the road. But I'm wondering, you know, when might we, um, now that we've crossed the 42% barrier, when might we see what the next target is? Sure, that's a good question. We are, this is actually um, our 20, in the 2020 contract is when you'll see the new bar because this was actually a calendar year 19 target. So we were actually ahead of schedule. We hit that in May, but we actually have until December to achieve it. Does that answer your question? Yes. Well, I think the, the bigger question though is if there is a change, which there is, in uh, the policy, what is the ultimate goal? What do you think is ach ach achievable? Well, uh, I think that it's going to be a completely different goal because we are now, so if we take the percentage of Vermonters who have been asked, 42.86, and 95% of them choose to opt in, we expect the rate to be around, the national average is around 95%. So it's hard to say right now, but we expect a high percentage of percent, percentage of patients will remain opted in and a low percentage will choose to opt out, but it's hard to, to know. We're still really in development of, we're working with DIVA in collaboration with DIVA to identify different deliverables and um, that will be in the next presentation. Some of that will be in the next presentation. So I think in the last discussion on consent, I, I let it be known that I had never been asked to ever even consider consenting and that my primary care doctor was retiring. Since that time, I do have a new primary care provider and I didn't want to lead them, so I never asked. But once again, I was never shown a, a document to uh, opt in. Yeah. I, I, Mr. Chair, I think, um, I think it's reasonable to expect that you'll see this in the 90s when we switch over in March. How long will it take to reach that 90s? Well, because the policy is changing to an opt-out, everyone will be in until, until or if they've already chosen to opt-out. Does that make sense? I think you're going to see it fairly soon. It's a low okay. percentage right now. Right after the uh, March implementation. Okay. Great. It's confusing. I just had a question on, do you have any technical concerns of that cutoff date and all of a sudden it's switching, you know, from the opt-in to the opt-out and, you know, how are you guys prepared for that? That's a great question and actually um, I think I'll be here for the next presentation and we have a whole slide on that if it's okay to defer to that. We don't have any concerns at this time if that answers your question now, but we Great. will get into more detail. Okay, thanks. Jess. Um, you mentioned working with locations and on data integrity and the quality of data. So I'm just wondering, are there uh, common mistakes that you're seeing across multiple location trends, and can you 
identify those and share with the other locations that you have not reached out to. So, you know, speeding up the data integrity process could happen. Absolutely. There are some common things. Um, actually, I had, coincidentally, I had a client reach out today and say, uh, by the way, we have a patient with the wrong middle initial entered into our system. And how do we get that fixed at VITAL? And the answer is the source system, your electronic health record, will need to be updated. And once those are updated, the messages get transmitted to the VHI, and it's corrected. So those kinds of things happen all the time. Um, in terms of common patterns, it's a little bit all over the place. But we're this part of the work that we do, and it's seems to be very valuable for providers and organizations because um, one wrong initial, one wrong letter can make two patients when they really should be one. So. Yeah, I'm just wondering, if you're, is there a mechanism by which you're, you're noticing some of these trends and disseminating, hey, you know, these are five things you should be looking we out for yes. in your data, you know? We we think with the new external MPI, we're going to have a lot of capabilities to do exactly yeah. that, to reach out to organizations and say, hey, we're seeing these trends. You may want to take a look at what, what is going on here. But with the external MPI, it gives us a whole new range of capabilities to do things like that. And the timing of that? Uh, we hope to have that operational by the end of the year. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? I just have one on, also on the connectivity requirement and criteria. Uh, are, are the 10 locations that you listed in slide 13 all hospitals, or what type of provider organizations are those, if you happen to know? Those are minute locations. OK. So primarily practices, but um, Great. yeah. I did have one other question. Let me just remember what it was. Oh, um, on the point of care utilization slide, um, can you remind us the the what the cross community access entails for the provider? I know with the vital access, it's a web based system. People go to the web and sign in with the single sign on. It's implemented with the EHR. But what's the third one? I'm, Sure. Not so cross-community access is a deeper level of integration. So if you think about it in the context of reaching out across the community from within your EHR screen and pulling back information about a patient, that's what cross-community access is. Great. Thank you. Sure. Um, and then lastly, on the provider results delivery, um, it looks a little bit like this is a downward trend. Is that normal over the course of the year, or is that uh, is that connected in any way to the increase in the EHR adoption or it's a what's great going question. on? It's a great question. What we're seeing, is, I expect we'll see slightly downward trend over the year here, but this is primarily due to practices integrating into a hospital electronic health record system. So they're merging essentially and they don't have the need to get external results delivery because they think now they're all in one system. So we'll probably continue to see these trends as organizations consolidate and try to be more efficient. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? You say all your questions for me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any closing remarks to say before we open it up to the public? We're fine. OK. Um, public comment or questions? Yes, Dale? On page 11, meaningful use in security risk assessment consultation. March shows 103.5 hours for seven sites, where if you look at the overall trend, it looks like there was probably average out about 10 hours per site. I'm putting all the six months together. I was just curious why, is there something else in there as to why seven sites took 103 hours? Whoever wants to. Go ahead. I'm not going to answer that. I, I just want to make sure I understand your question. You're wondering why there are only seven locations in, in 103 hours? 
Yeah, because if you look at the other, if you've got um, 97 hours for 10 sites, you've got uh, 90.75 hours for 8 sites, you've got 88.75 for 8 sites, so you're... Sure. You're, it's a high it's, concentration. Yeah, yes. but I'm wondering why it's, out, it's an outlier, sort of. It may not be, that's why I was asking. Right. No, it really just depends on what's needed and the work and the projects that we're doing with those clients at the time. So they, some take longer than others based on their needs. It, it's hard to predict, but we, we make sure that, so you, you will probably likely see a continued high concentration of a lower number of sites in a high number of hours. This is a tremendous amount of time each month to try to ensure that the quality of the data is captured in the right area of their medical record. And then the other piece of that is, is it being transmitted to the beehive? And are there other in measures that that provider needs to meet in order to qualify for some of their other incentives? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So are there specific sites that are proven to be really challenging? Um, not necessarily. I think it's more just in the, in the interest of, of continued improvement and learning the system. Thank you. Other public comments or questions? Susan. Uh, Susan Aronoff from the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. And I have a question about something that wasn't covered in the slides, but I thought that I'd heard about it in the past as part of the you know, vital relaunch, vital 2.0, um, which is the concept of a patient portal. So I was just at a, um, a gathering with some top care consumers uh, that you're going to be hearing about in the next section, like a diva sort of reaching out to stakeholders. And that question came up a number of times. People said, well, I'd really like to be able to see what's in there to make sure it's accurate, because so often my record isn't accurate. And, and so that question, it, it, it's come up before. If you have a plan for a time when Vermonters will be able to see what's in the beehive, that their own personal information from the beehive? It's interesting because I've been asking the same question um, on a patient portal. What, what I think we can, um, what we want to do is get through phase one and phase two first. Uh, phase one being the, the implementation of an MPI, the terminology services, getting into the interfaces and the entrance of the interfaces. Phase two being sort of the database that we share in this. But it is not off our radar sc uh, screen in terms of what we, uh, what we would like to do in the future. Um, of course, we want to make sure that we do not sort of confuse the argument with what patient portals are out there for the individual um, healthcare centers. So we're going to have to be delicate in how we do this. But at the same time, it's something that we've heard now from you and others that would be something that would be a benefit to Vermonters, and we're going to be looking at it probably in a third, a third phase here. I think, if I could just add a comment, I think it would help with the um, confidence building that people might need to opt in, but even you know, in the new scenario come March when people are just going to be in automatically, um, if they're deciding whether or not to opt out, they might want to look in and say, hey, it looks pretty good to me, or uh-oh, that's not my name, that's mm -hmm. not my initial, I better even say that. Yeah, that's a good point. And just to elaborate on that a little bit more, I, I don't want to steal this under the next presentation, um, but at the same time, we are looking at ways in for them uh, for a better mechanism in order to uh, look at that information and look at, uh, at ways to either opt in or opt out. Well, to opt out. Is the biggest hurdle really trying to protect the security of somebody accessing someone else's information? That's one uh, a aspect of it, and making sure that we do have the security mechanisms uh, in place. Uh, the other is just pure uh, timing and getting, getting up 
to where we need to be technologically in order to do this. Um, we've come a long way in a year and a half. I would imagine in a year and a half you're going to see a huge leap in our abilities to do various things. Okay. Other questions or comments from the public? Now, I can promise all that because I'm not going to be here. So. <laughs> we won't make the other three people sitting at the table make the same promise. <laughs> so I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Another great quarterly update, and uh, things are moving in the right direction. Thank you. So at this point, we're going to um, welcome Jenny and the team from DIVA to come down. And whenever you're ready, Jenny, take it away. Carmel and other members of the board, thank you for having us. Um, we're very excited to uh, share with you the progress that we've made in terms of both developing a plan for implementation of um, the transition from opt-out uh, opt out consent or opt-in consent to opt-out consent. Um, I'd like to, uh, before we get started, at least introduce the team members that I've brought with me today. Um, as you know from the past, typically it's Emily Richard who runs the HIE program uh, within, the, within DIVA who would do these presentations. In her absence, um, while she is on family leave, uh, we've got Terry Beckett um, who has worked with the state before and previously has had Emily's um, position um, many years ago but since then has been a consultant to the Office of the National Coordinator and been working at the national level on health IT programs. He is helping to lead up the team in constructing the HIE plan this year and also in kind of overseeing uh, the consent process. In addition to that, I've brought with me Maureen Gilbert, uh, who uh, is a consultant to uh, the Department of Vermont Health Access and has been for many years on stakeholder engagement and really has been leading up the stakeholder engagement um, process. Um, for us, and you know Andrea. So from here, I'm gonna let Terry go ahead and get, get us started in terms of what our progress update is. But before we do, do you have any questions for us before we get started? Not before you start. Okay. <laughs> okay, so can you hear me okay? We can. Great, thank you. Um, so today we're providing an update on uh, fetal lead activities as called for in Act 53. Uh, next slide. Uh, DIVA has specific responsibilities in Act 53 for Section 4, which is the Health Information Technology Plan, and Section 5, which is the, uh, the VHI, the opt-out consent policy, and the implementation of that. So we'll do a general overview of the requirements and our approach, and uh, then we'll go into more detail on the different work streams that we've identified. We've identified three work streams, uh, stakeholder engagement, mechanisms, and evaluation. I'll sketch those out very briefly on the next slide, which we can go to now. And then um, we'll individually talk about, about those in a little more detail. And of course, feel free to raise questions as we're, as we're going or however you prefer. So for consent, we've identified three work streams. The uh, stakeholder engagement work stream is perhaps the most important, at least for now, and certainly the immediate priority. Uh, we're trying to meet the requirements of the Act, of course, which is the substantial opportunities for public input. Um, we're creating patient education mechanisms. And, and the big part is enabling patients to fully understand their rights regarding the sharing of their health information. And then moving into uh, mechanisms, we have to identify mechanisms by which Vermonters can easily opt out. And that, of course, is why Andrea has stayed on for our portion of the present presentation. Um, and then evaluation, we want to evaluate the overall effectiveness of our work. So just one more brief comment on stakeholder engagement. We're doing that to develop the best possible strategy for getting a message out and taking into account uh, people's ability to hear the message and who should help deliver the message. And Maureen will talk in more detail about that. Which one is plus? Yeah, thank you. And then of course, just a reminder that we have reporting and accountability built into the app. 
So we're here with an August 1. We have uh, delivered the first legislative update to you. We'll be back in November 1 with another update. And in January 15th, a final report about the implementation. And of course, the actual rollout occurs on March the 1st. In between there, uh, we also do annual reporting again on November 1 for the Health Information Exchange Strategic Plan update, uh, which per the Act has to include some elements of what we're doing with the consent policy. So with that, I think we're ready to start talking about stakeholder engagement. And then we're going to go with it. Hi. Um, so I'm just going to start by orienting. All right, so I'm going to talk um, a little bit about the requirements that we have for this process, and then we'll get into the timeline and how it's been going so far. So Act 53 requires that we communicate with each Vermonter, and you'll see that language each. We're going to come back to that. I think that's important. Um, a number of different things. We need to communicate to them the purpose of the Vermont Health Information Exchange, the way in which health information is currently collected, how and with whom health information can be shared using the Vermont Health Information Exchange, the purpose for which it can be shared, how to opt out, and how patients can change their consent status in the future. So that's quite a list of uh, communications objectives for us. And we're doing a deep stakeholder engagement series in order to understand how we can achieve those objectives. Um, we're, we're also starting um, in that process to think about of course, building awareness early, right? Starting now, we're working on building awareness um, through this stakeholder engagement series. And we're also getting commitment from some of these organizations who are advocates for special populations that we're trying to reach. Um, their commitment to act as messengers here. We know we can't get this, this message out to each Vermonter without um, commitment from all of the advocacy organizations that are interested and many of our partners in the state. So our timeline here, it's an aggressive timeline. We are already in the stakeholder engagement process. Um, that's gonna continue through November. There's a couple of different phases within that. Um, from November to December, we're also gonna be finalizing messages and materials design and beginning production there. Um, we'll be rolling out to messengers a toolkit and training in December and January, and then pretty quickly starting public communications through those messengers and also directly from the state. In February, right before consent, the new consent policy takes effect, we're gonna be intensifying that message um, just in those weeks ahead of time so that people really have a, a good opportunity to make a choice ahead of the, the consent policy being implemented. All right, so a little bit more depth here about the stakeholder engagement process, that period um, beginning in June, July. So the first step here, and one that we've already taken, is to interview advocates for the rights of all Vermonters. And that's included the ACLU and the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. We've also spent some time identifying the special populations. And the special populations here are um, groups that we think have members with concerns about sharing their health data, um, and who have told us that they have members with concerns about sharing their health data for reasons of stigma, for instance, that could be people living with HIV AIDS. Um, reasons of personal safety, for instance, people who have experience of domestic violence. Um, and then special populations who may just require a different approach in terms of our communications to make sure that we um, really reach them and help them to understand the messages here. And that includes people who have developmental disabilities and people who have other languages, um, who their primary language is not English. So we've been working to engage those special populations, starting with their advocates. So first going out to um, advocates, Susan, for instance, has been part of that process, um, and talking to people about how, to, how they might participate in being messengers, how they might consider participating in actually um, administering the opt-out um, for their members, on behalf of their members, so that it's not something that just has to happen at providers' offices but advocacy organizations might be able to participate in that. And then asking them to really gather some of their members to engage in interviews and focus groups so we can really learn directly from the people who are gonna be impacted by this change. 
Then in this July to September period, we have our first round of interviews and focus groups with um, both special populations and members of the general public. And um, through these interviews and focus groups, we're really looking to understand people's communications needs. Um, what questions they need answered in order to make an informed choice about um, staying opted in beginning in March or um, choosing to opt out? And then how best to reach them. So we're really asking people, you know, where do you want to hear this message? Where is it going to feel most relevant? And, and how can we best reach you? We're then looking and really excited to go back to um, many of these same groups in October, November, and do a second round of interviews and focus groups to test the messages to make sure that we're achieving the objectives of um, this, this clear, mes uh, clear messages, um, hitting all those communications objectives that we mentioned earlier. And then starting to both test the opt-out mechanisms that we're putting in place in March and use these groups to design future opt-out mechanisms. We know that um, we, we have sort of an idea of the mechanisms that are going to be in place in March. We have a good idea, and Andrea will talk you through that later. But we also know that we want to continue working after March to make sure that this is as easy as possible for every Vermonter who wants to opt out. So we're going to use, use these um, interviews and focus groups to do a bit of design work with, with them. And then we know that our work is not going to be over in March, that we're going to need to do ongoing learning about um, how best to communicate with people about their health information and um, continue to optimize our messages and our channels so that we um, have really, really clear messages and that we're reaching everybody and that that mechanism is easy. Any questions before we tell you uh, just quickly about who we've engaged so far? All right. Sure. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so I watched the legislation unfold, and um, when I read the uh, phrase, um, each Vermonter, I, I was kind of um, trying to, in my head, envision how you would ever reach that goal. But knowing that this board would want to set a bar as high as possible to um, make sure that uh, people are educated about the consent policy. I'm curious how you've interpreted what the phrase each Vermonter means. So why don't I tell you a little bit about how we think we might reach each Vermonter, um, or as many Vermonters as we possibly can. And then I think we should continue to talk about sort of the definition of each here. But if you, if you just reach as many Vermonters as you possibly can, would, will you meet the legislative intent of each Vermonter? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that's been one of the largest questions that we've had um, when we've met with the ACLU and the Office of the Vermont Healthcare Advocate. I think it's, the, it's not clear um, if you take it for face value, each Vermonter, that means getting a message out to every single Vermonter in Vermont. Um, and uh, Is a Vermonter just a Vermonter in Vermont? What if they're in the Peace Corps in Somalia or something like that? Exactly. And so uh, as we go through this process, we're trying to define strategies that we feel will most closely get to that. Um, and we believe that through our evaluation mechanisms, uh, we will go ahead and test um, whether Vermonters have really um, received the information, have they understood the information that they've needed, and do they have the mechanisms in, in place. Um, and that will allow us to help set the benchmark for what, whether we feel like we've achieved each Vermonter, um, you know, whether we can uh, achieve the goal of making sure that every single Vermonter has received the information in a way that they, uh, that they can understand it is yet to be determined. I have a follow-up question on this sure. topic, so I'll ask it now. Um, I didn't notice an appropriation in uh, in the act. Was there anything in the budget to support this effort? We have applied for some funds through the IAPD to support some of the outreach uh, efforts. Through the what? The IAPD still requires a 10% state match, but was there new funding in state match? There was not new funding appropriated, no. Thank you. You got, you got to help us. This, we're 
the anachronistically challenged individuals of the board. <laughs> Kevin, I'm going to have to call a friend on that one. The reason I use the acronym is I can't remember what it is. So, <laughs> I don't remember what it is either, but it's okay. the technology company that gets 9010 match from the feds. Exactly. Thank you. It now I know what you're talking about at least. I don't think the acronym actually would illuminate anything more than that. No, I don't think that it would. <laughs> Thank you. So, other, other questions from the board? That's what I, I have on the Okay. Board. Okay. And so the way that we're thinking that we're going to go about um, reaching as many Vermonters as we possibly can is sort of a threefold communication strategy. And the first um, pillar of that strategy is to really use the advocacy organizations and um, other organizations that we partner with regularly to, to work um, directly with their members. So people who already have trusting relationships, who already have communications channels, be it, you know, newsletters, social media feeds, um, and really leverage those channels as much as possible to reach all the special populations and then um, actually uh, Vermonters in, in general populations as well. So we've got our messengers who we're working with. Um, then we've got the providers and the provider organizations. And we know, and we'll talk a little bit in a second, about um, how important consumers, um, Vermonters, think it is to hear about this from their providers. So we really want to make sure that message is getting delivered in the provider office. Um, and then the third pillar is sort of broader public outreach. And you know, knowing that we don't have um, a ton of funding on this, we're not talking about you know, television or, or much paid media, but we are talking about things like um, you know, pitching to the news, um, making sure that this information is widely available through through news and through just some tactics like Front Porch Forum. We'll certainly come back with a more detailed list of tactics as those develop as we learn from Vermonters where they'd like to hear this. But, but those Did you consider what like Maine did with a direct mail? You know, we, we have thought about mail and we're hearing different things from um, different, different advocates that we talk to about whether mail is an effective strategy. And we haven't decided whether uh, or, or how much to use mail. For instance, uh, I was speaking with some advocates on behalf of older Vermonters earlier in the week, and they were saying, you know, we, we have some folks who just aren't online, and we need to find other ways of reaching them. And one of the ways that they've done that historically is is through mail. Um, but we've, we've heard the other side, too. Yeah, for example, the ACLU specifically did not feel like that would be an effective mechanism to reach each Vermonter. Well, well probably I, not in and of itself, but as part of a larger <laughs> strategy. Yep. Go well, ahead, Robin. I was Robin. just going to say, I mean, you wouldn't have the addresses of every Vermonter in, within your agency. Yeah. No, yeah. but as somebody who's run a campaign before, I know that you can go to the post office and buy each address without having to know, and mm -hmm. it's actually cheaper. Yeah. So, Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, Kevin, I think one of the things that, that or Chair Miller, one of the things that you are um, <coughs> highlighting for us uh, is that we are not, uh, we are planning on taking a multi pronged approach. Um, and that, that's one of the things that we think is very important um, in this process uh, in order to try to reach our, our goal of each Vermonter um, and also to uh, meet the needs of special populations. Thank you. All right, so just um, quickly letting you know where we're at in this process so far. These are the stakeholders we've engaged. You'll see that um, we have a call in here for the advocates we've engaged and another one for the ones we've actually conducted um, member focus groups with so far. Um, we are really open to hearing if there's another special population that, that you think it's important that we connect with. We're um, always open to expanding this list. I'm curious about what contact it means. Like, how did you contact teenagers? Oh, so uh, this means contacting the advocates on, um, who are working on behalf of teenagers, for instance, a spectrum. Um, is an organization that we so know. So that brings them. up my second question. Um, how geographically diverse is your reach out? Because Spectrum obviously doesn't cover the entire state, so. Sure. Um, so something we want to be mindful of, um, we've certainly worked with some organizations who are not Chittenden County based so far, um, but we can think about that as we develop the remainder of the focus groups. And many of the organizations that we have reached out to at, at this point in time um, represent the, the state and are helping us to identify where communities might be best to outreach to. 
Um, and we will take we can take that back as a special focus on ensuring that that's geographically diverse. But most of these, other than spectrum, represent a state uh, statewide presence. You've also got the box checked that says general public. How did you check that box? <laughs> sure, sure. So. Um, we're doing some focus, well, the advocates for the general public we're thinking of as the Office of the Healthcare Advocate and the ACLU. In terms of members of the general public, our first strategy here is to work through the Blueprint Community Health Teams and have them recruit people um, on our behalf for focus groups. And so far we um, have done one in St. Johnsbury and have one um, planned in Burlington and are working to, to add more here. Maureen, I think it's also worth noting that in our second phase, we plan on doing much more pub we plan on doing public forums um, that could potentially be scheduled around the state to in, to not just go through the, the focus group process, but to engage a broader um, public. One of the things I just I'll add when I read the legislative report, I was a little concerned because it didn't uh, specifically reference mental health services and, mm -hmm. and folks with substance use disorder. And I, I'm really happy to hear that. See here, mm -hmm. I was going to bring that up today. So I don't know if there's a mechanism by which you might amend the legislative report to include both of those okay. stakeholder groups because I think they're really important, and I think they're obviously included. So yeah, I think that brings up a, a bigger question for me, and see if this would assist. Is there, as this moves forward, one of the things that we're doing is as we talk to different advocacy organizations and different groups of people, they are highlighting, and we're hoping you will today as well highlighting um, additional populations that we should be reaching out to or different advocacy groups that we are reaching out to. So this is an initial list, but it will be dynamically kind of snowballing forward um, as, as we go and as, as reasonable. And what you saw from Maureen's, uh, one of Maureen's slides a uh, few back, uh, we do believe that this is gonna be an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. um, as we complete the evaluation results, we will identify um, uh, identify additional potential mechanisms that we need. We will identify additional populations that may not necessarily have been served or are very well served. And so we believe it will be an ongoing and iterative process. So let us think through some mechanisms to keep you and others informed of what of who we're reaching out to. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's fantastic. Um, I'm wondering, is there a mechanism through your website where you can be not yeah. only updating, continually updating this list, but soliciting feedback and input from That's a great folks. idea. So, yeah. Yeah, one, of the thing, one of the groups that sticks out initially is the faith-based community. Mm -hmm. And I take a look at uh, Vermont having one of the higher populations as a percentage of people who are um, investing in um, health sharing ministries rather than insurance. And when you talk to those members, one of their biggest reasons is they don't want their information out to anyone. And I think that um, that conversation is going to have to occur. I know it's a, a, a small subset of Vermonters, but um, certainly winning them over to having um, their information in the database in case they are in a situation where it could be really helpful to them would be a valuable conversation. Yeah. It's very helpful. Thank you. And just one question on if you um, have any learnings from other states, because obviously a lot of the other states are already running this, and we've heard they're about 95%. So the 5% that aren't you know, in the program that are opting out, you know, are we cross-referencing that to make sure we're capturing you know, those people yeah. that may not want to be in? Part of our process and one of our steps in the process is uh, outreaching to other states um, as we identify needs um, to find out what they've done that's been successful. Um, as has been identified, we don't have a large budget. We don't want to recreate the wheel if another state has already um, done this and done it well. Um, we uh, we want to learn from that, and so in that case, Vital has 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 done some outreach, as has Diva, um, to begin to make inquiries to other states. We also are tapping into resources we have here within the state. Um, the Department of Health has a significant. Um, level of experience at doing statewide campaigns to get information out, as has Vermont Health Connect. Um, and so we are u leveraging and using um, their experience to begin to consider the mechanisms um, that they use to, to get the word out and that they've learned have been successful and not successful because we don't want to repeat mistakes that the state's right, already made. There's a lot out there. So it's just not out there. So that, that's a great idea. And 
um, and we'll definitely make it ro more robust, but we have, have, we have started that process to reach out to other states. Another great stakeholder group that you could engage is the business community when you think about all the different associations that have newsletters and, and things like that. It would probably be uh, an easy way to uh, try to get the word out to a, a large group of people. Yeah, insurers is another one that's not on here. Um, as you know, Diva both acting as the oversight of the HIE, but also as an insurer, we've begun to engage our peer partners um, as a way and, and also to engage their businesses. So. I did have a couple other suggestions for groups based on the legislative report, so you may already have reached out to these folks, but um, I was noticing that you had cultural brokers program, but not Vermont refugee resettlement. So um, I was going to suggest that for uh, folks with safety issues, the network against domestic violence could be a good partner. Maybe you've already reached out to them as yeah. well. Um, and then the other place I was thinking is maybe the community action agencies, since they have statewide presence as well. Yeah, that's a good idea. And before we wrap on stakeholder engagement, we just wanted to let you know a little bit of what we're hearing out of the first set of focus groups that we've done. It's only been three, so I want to be very clear that we could come back here having done, you know, six more and have a completely different story, but I think it's always interesting to hear where we're at so far. Um, so far, we've, we've spoken with... Um, people with developmental disabilities, we've spoken with people living with AIDS, and we've spoken with um, some members of a, the general public who are patients of a community health team. In doing so, we've heard from everybody, really across the board, that they are not aware of the Vermont Health Information Exchange. And, and to a large extent, are not even aware of the rules around um, how their information is shared, in, their health information is shared in traditional ways. So, um, you know, is my doctor allowed to share information with another doctor via phone and fax without my signature? That is not something that everybody is, is really clear on yet. So we've got our work cut out for us um, in order just to get to the conversation about consent, opt-in, opt-out. Um, there's a lot of questions as we're bringing up this message. Is this about my insurance? You know, folks here at Vermont Health, they hear exchange, they automatically go to their insurance. Um, so we're going to have to make sure that we're really crystal clear that this is about health information sharing, not about your coverage. Um, we also want to make sure that we don't worry anybody uh, in bringing this up, that there's nothing that's going to change for you, um, that you have a, an option to opt out, but if you do nothing, your, everything continues as it currently is in terms of your, your coverage and your care. That's important to folks. Um, we're hearing a real desire and expectation that providers know know you as a patient um, and your care history. We're, we're hearing that loud and clear, and folks really would appreciate not having to tell their story again and again, particularly the nitty-gritty details, their medications, their allergies, really wanting to get quickly to sort of the heart of the conversation with their providers. Um, and so welcoming the Vermont, information, Vermont Health Information Exchange's ability to do that for them. Um, Number of questions about who can view my data. So we, we're going to have to be very clear that this means your treating provider can view your health information, and it's not any provider in the state. It's not anybody within a healthcare organization. People want to know who it is and what the rules are around that and what the protections are. And lastly, where does this information come from? Folks have lots of ideas for us about tactics for reaching out, but their first choice messenger is almost universally their provider. We know that that's going to be a challenge and that it's, in fact, may not be possible within the, the span of an appointment that a patient has with their providers. But if that is their, their preferred method, we need to think about proxies for that and how we get as cl close as we possibly can to that, that goal that they're stating of a healthcare provider sharing this information and their rights and options with them. Any questions before we finish? Let me just jump, before you jump on, off of stakeholders for a yeah. second. Um, I'm just thinking about the process of you've engaged stakeholders and the stakeholders will be a mechanism by which you disseminate the messaging. And you're, prover you know, you're providing some of these toolkits and webinars and training. But I'm imagining as the stakeholder list grows, the number and diversity of agencies, organizations, 
uh, advocacy groups that are disseminating the message. How do you think about uh, ensuring that all of the information is accurate? Is you know, I mean, you're going to provide these toolkits, but to some degree, you're relying on you know the training working and the toolkits working to get the message out correctly by lots of different groups. Is that so I'll start and I'll let Maureen um, add on to that. Um, based on what we've heard so far in the initial three focus groups, um, it is still the provider community that uh, they prefer to hear information about how their, how their health information is, is exchanged. We will, I believe, in our initial, uh, if that continues to be the case, I believe in our initial approach, we'll focus on um, the provider community, but expanding that a little bit. So looking at our mental health providers, <coughs> the folks who are providing services for individuals developmental, with developmental disabilities, and um, who are helping to support individuals in receiving their health care um, through programs like the Refugee Resettlement Program. So we, I think that we will have to choo pick and choose in this first year who those messengers are to ensure the quality messages and focus. That said, we do believe that in order to gather the information through the stakeholders, that it is important that we engage a large number of stakeholders and advocacy groups in hearing those best messages. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, yep. thank you. Okay. So I know you had some questions on the mechanisms, so we'll turn it over to Andrea from Vital. Thank you. Or maybe I only have one slide. So. Oops, maybe. Okay, so this is primarily the focus of Vital's work is to expand the opportunities for Vermonters to easily opt out of the VHI or opt out, opt out of having their information viewed through the VHI. We, the work that we've done so far, I believe Do uh, Governor Scott signed the bill on June, June 10th. 10th. On June 20th, we assembled a team and have been meeting on a weekly basis, at least weekly since then. We developed a comprehensive project plan that includes the critical elements to a complex project like this, including we meet, uh, updating our policies and procedures to reflect and support the new legislation on March 1st of 2020. We're currently identifying use cases, workflows, and really ensuring that the proper security measures are taken to verify identity and those kinds of things are, are, are cared for. We also need to update our consent education materials, very important, and we will we'll be collaborating a lot with Diva, Maureen, and Jenny, and uh, Terry on these types of things. And then moving on to the next bullet, maintaining continuity of previous consent decisions. This is super important for patients that have previously chosen to opt out of the VHI, that after March 1st of 2020, that remain in an opt-out state. When it comes to solutions design and documentation, there really are two parts here. There is a technical configuration in our current provider portal that needs that currently supports the opt-in policy on March 1st of 2020 that technical configuration needs to be changed to then support an opt-out consent policy so that's the first piece the second piece of this is to allow the VHI to or vital to collect patient consent and to expand the opportunities for patients to easily opt out of the VHI. Currently, the only way a patient can choose to opt in or opt out of the VHI is by visiting a participating healthcare provider. In the new world, on March 1st to 2020, we, this really ties back to expanding the opportunities. In addition to participating healthcare providers, our goal is to provide other opportunities, such as with engaged stakeholders, that will be informed about the process and to provide guidance to the people that visit them and then get information to VITAL to then care for that patient's consent decision, as well as offer the opportunity to visit the website that we have available and make a consent choice request. There, this is really very much in development and as we get more feedback, we can uh, adapt, but we are on target at this point in time, we're on target to be ready for February 1st, which is one month prior to the effective date, which I believe is in Act 53. 
I said a lot, but do you have any questions? Questions? Continue. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Robin. Um, I know you mentioned it makes sense that in the, the web-based portal where providers are um, going to vital access to look at it, that, the, that you'd have to reconfigure that. Will you have to uh, change something in the EHRs that have been configured to have direct access as well? You're talking about the electronic consent collection? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So that's part of this. Great, thank you. So very briefly, uh, talk about the evaluation methodology. So the act uh, requires us to identify a methodology to evaluate the extent to which all of the public outreach that we've just been hearing about, we have to gauge the extent to which that has been successful. Uh, so to do that, so far we have identified the four core questions that you see here, very, very fundamental to the process and to the purpose, which is, have we reached people? Is the message clear and is it understood? Are the opt-out options easy? And which providers are offering opt-out? So to pursue the methodology for getting to these questions, uh, we've, we've identified so far the statewide patient experience survey as, as one source of being able to measure this. And we've established a, a planning group inside DIVA, an ad hoc committee basically. And the plan will be developed and will be incorporated into the health information exchange strategic plan that is due to you on November 1st. So that's how we'll be communicating the evaluation plan to you. Can you tell us a little bit about the makeup of the uh, eval committee that will meet in September? As part of our stakeholder engagement process, um, we are asking folks who, who they believe would be able to help inform us in terms of our evaluation methodology. Um, right now, this is uh, our work stream that has the least amount of development, um, and we've convened, at, uh, we've convened an internal team to define the stakeholder process that includes vital, um, Vital has been a key partner throughout this entire process. Um, it includes uh, representation from um, the evaluators from the Blueprint for Health we're drawing from the staff that we have internally um, and the folks that you see here. Um, we have yet to engage stakeholders, but we'll, uh, we'll be doing so shortly. Do you have an optimal size? Something that's manageable. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you believe that, what do you believe that is? Uh, I believe that that optimal size is probably around 10 to 12 individuals, uh, but also uh, similar to the way that we have sought stakeholder feedback um, through the rest of the process, engaging the rest of these organizations to vet the plan. Okay. I just build on that for a quick second. I'm just thinking, um, if the primary vehicle through which a lot of the consent education is gonna take place really is the provider community, as you all have mentioned, um, I'm thinking that engaging organizations like the Vermont Medical Society, Health First, VOS, really early on in the process, um, and particularly in the testing of the messaging and in this evaluation process, would be really helpful. And you probably have done that, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, no, I think that that's, that. that is really helpful. One of the things that I will say that we have not mentioned to date is that uh, we are giving regular, our, the Health Information Exchange Steering Committee meets every other week. Um, and we have representation from a broad set of stakeholders there who are also providing us guidance and, f and feedback. So um, I think that that's, that's worth mentioning here and we definitely will take back um, the question of how to, to even further engage the provider community. Great, thank you. Are you fully confident that you'll have a, a, a solid plan for us on November 1st? Yes, <laughs> we are on target. Okay. Questions. I had a question about the what, and you that you may not have gotten this far in your evaluation planning, but what you were thinking in terms of the timing of the evaluation, because obviously Act mm -hmm. 53 asks you to present the methodology by January, mm -hmm. but you won't have actually gone through the the implementation right. to do the evaluation of the implementation at that time. 
I don't want to presume what the evaluation process will look like okay. um, at this point in time. What I can say, and the reason we put the one of the, the predominant mechanisms up here is the patient experience survey, is that during the legislative process, we started to ask this question of how do we, rather than checking off whether each provider um, has informed each patient, um, which wouldn't necessarily answer these, th these four questions, are there other mechanisms? One of those mechanisms is the patient experience survey, um, and we will have initiated that um, before the January 15th report, and are hoping to have some baseline results maybe for the January 15th report. If not, I think you can expect us in our other reporting to you to come back uh, with those results shortly thereafter. There will be additional evaluation mechanisms. Another evaluation mechanism that VITAL currently has is right now they're asking which providers provide opt-out and they're tracking that. That, that we will also be able to, to report um, in, in relatively early in the process. And I, I invite any members of the committee also who want to help. I know a couple of you have a lot of experiences in this arena to provide us input, input and feedback. <laughs> I'm not so sure that it would be proper since we have to This is true. decide if it's been done thoroughly. So, yeah. Tom. Yeah, I just want to emphasize something Reen uh, raised, which is I recall from the Health Tech Solutions Report, um, many states have gone before us in this arena. and. Um, to me, that's an important context to you know, have our arms around uh, what that means. Um, you know, this issue here has been controversial here in Vermont, and I think that context and experience of other states uh, is is valuable to have. Um, I also want to ask: Is what what if you get to the end of this process and there is still no consensus? Consensus, I just want to clarify the question. Consensus on the, on the mechanisms that we should yes, undertake? Right, consensus in terms of how to, uh, to uh, approach the um, education of the public and the involvement of the public in uh, mm -hmm. helping them make a decision as to whether they opt in or opt out. Yeah, so I want to clarify one, one element. Um, in, our, in our stakeholder engagement process, we are not arbitrating um, whether we should have an opt-in or opt-out policy. Uh, we believe that that was handled uh, through the legislature last yeah. year. What we are asking is what are some of the mechanisms um, and are committed to a multi-pronged um, multi and multi-sector approach. Um, there seems to be consensus at this point that that multi-pronged and multi-sector approach is the right, is the right approach. Um, we are working with each of the different advocacy groups to get to understand what they feel would assist uh, for their populations and the, gener and the general public. Um, we feel like that uh, gives us enough bounds to say that we have at minimum kind of met uh, the intent um, without having every organization have to agree on every mechanism um, that, that, we have, that we will be putting in place. So I, I do think that there is consensus already that a multi-sector, multi-pronged approach is the right approach. Um, some may say a mailing versus no mailing, um, but most of them can at least agree that there are that each of that there are at least some things that are that are helpful. So that that is our approach. I think you've got a very tough uh, road ahead of you because I think where the consensus problem is going to lie is whether or not. Um, You've reached that each Vermonter threshold, and that's going to be a tough one. Well, it's going to be a problem because I'm born and raised in Arlington, Vermont, and because Kevin's from uh, Rutland, north of me, he doesn't consider me a Vermonter. <laughs> <laughs> you think you have that? Yeah. <laughs> I grew up in Brattleboro. Other questions? Any closing remarks, or can we open it up to the public comment? I actually have a couple other questions on the report, but I was going to, I was saving those till after the end, but uh, maybe I can jump into those now. Right. Do you have more to present, Jenny? We're good, thank you. Okay. okay. Um, uh, so on, um, I'm looking at the legislative report, and um, there is, in the beginning part of the report, there's a discussion of promoting meaningful consent as described in the gold standard, um, which is um, the, the goal set out by the Office of National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. 
um, and uh, and that that's the gold standard that you're sort of striving for, but that the um, the act requires, in my reading, HIPAA plus the Part Two, so the current federal requirements. Um, those don't necessarily, to me, seem like the same standard. So I just wanted to get your sense of how you're thinking about uh, those two things. So meaningful consent is, as you said, the gold standard. So it's basically aspirational and more of a principle. And it's clearly not something that we could dictate or require. Uh, I think what we're recognizing already in some of the conversations that we're having is that there is confusion uh, around consent, even in the context of HIPAA, and especially 42 CFR. So even just addressing that part of the act, which says we're supposed to align the rollout of this policy in the context of HIPAA and 42 CFR, that alone is going to be very challenging. But in terms of developing tools and information kits and trying to reach providers, to better and have con better have better consent conversations with their patients in the context of care delivery is something that we can do that moves us toward this goal. Thank you. I, it was it was interesting to me because I, you know I I read the HIPAA consent forms, but I'm a lawyer. I don't think most people read them. I think they just sign them, right? Much less understand like what is a business associate, how does that all work, um, and that kind of thing. So I think you have a tough road to hoe. Uh, given court, the current state of understanding, as I think you're seeing in some of your stakeholder engagement. Um, I was also curious um, if you could talk a little bit more about some of the alternative communication approaches that you're considering. Um, in the report, you mentioned visualizations and audio or vi video messages, and I wondered if you could just talk a little bit more about those sorts of Issues. Sure. So we've already found in the process of doing the, the early focus groups that having like an animation about how the Vermont Health Information Exchange works is tremendously helpful. We know that people have lots of different learning styles and that visual learning is something that we want to support in this process. We also know that there's folks who um, have low levels of literacy or they're literate primarily in another language besides English and we want to support them with audio messages. For instance, one of the recommendations we've heard um, both from um, a woman who runs the Cultural Brokers Program and from the Vermont Department of Health is to consider having people who um, are from other countries and other cultures and who English is, is and who they, English is not their first language record a message in their primary in their first language and share that with other people in their community. And that um, we know that translation can be a challenge and that can help overcome that. So th that's just two examples of how we're thinking about alternative communications approaches. Can I follow up on that? Yeah. Sure. Because in addition to all those barriers, what about the time challenge? I'm sorry, say that again, please. Um, I'm thinking of the individuals that are just never going to take the time to oh. actually have a meaningful consent. They may sign something quickly, but um, they're, not, they're just always in a hurry, and sure. a lot of us are. <laughs> so, so as communicators, that, that is a challenge that, that we think about all the time, is how do we get this message across to people in the context of their busy lives, <coughs> often in a healthcare environment where they are concerned about something having to do with their health, and that's more pressing than what's happening with my health information. Um, I don't have a solution for you on that yet, but it is absolutely one of the challenges we're considering in this process. Um, and then I just had a couple questions about the engagement with healthcare practices and provider organizations. Um, in the report, you mentioned a, pro a provider survey that is designed to inform the state Medicaid HIT will include some questions around this as well. And I was just curious about the timing of the survey. Yeah, you know, the survey, uh, we actually initiated the survey on July the 12th, and it will end on August the 19th. And we hope to have uh, some summary conclusions published by the end of August. Great. So that should be in time to inform us. Great. And I'm curious, curious if you've gotten any pushback from the provider community around the consent issues, just in terms of workload or anything like that. 
Um, well, we know it's going to be an issue in terms of order flows, so yeah. we're, we're, in, we're simply anticipating that and hoping to be proactive. In terms of early results from the provider survey, I think what we're learning there is that uh, uh, consent is not a, a major topic of concern, that in a lot of cases people are not even familiar with the opt-in policy as it currently exists, and I'm talking about the provider community itself. Um, there's a large percentage of the provider community. And, and remember that this consent policy has to do with information that's in the beehive. Right. So that's, that's a more limiting concept. 25% um, of the providers don't know about the beehive, that it even exists. So Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Other questions from the board? Can I add to that? Sure. One of the things that uh, at our steering committee, in fact, that we had today is that both Vermont Medical Society and um, and uh, Boz are very interested in, in one care at helping us to communicate the messages to providers. Um, and so while they represent a provider network, those networks are excited in the change in the policy and they fit, and they've provided feedback to us that their providers are also, those who are aware are also excited. So just wanted to put that out there. Anything else from the board? If not, we're gonna open it up to public comment or questions. Dale? Um, I have two. The first one is a clarification because it reads um, which providers offer opt out? So that had me a little confused. Is it mandatory that providers opt in? And that providers. Is this that whole scenario where the consumer goes with the provider? Because the consumer status can be determined by what the provider chooses to do. The short answer to your question is no, it's the patient's decision. Consent is the patient's decision. Whether the change, is, the change happens in 2020 or not, consent is still your choice. So, so, the provider. so I, could you just clarify? I think I understand. You do? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, Dale, I think um, there's, there, we're confusing kind of apples and oranges in terms of consent with the ACO, um, with One Care Vermont, and consent with the VHI. Um, in the VHI, it, if a provider uh, is able to and is feeding information into the health information exchange, that, uh, that is not necessarily tied to the individual person's consent to have the information go into the health information exchange. Um, what we are asking for in consent in this case is can information be, can their health information then be shared among the provider um, community? Uh, and that, that really is the decision of the client or the patient um, in, in order to have that information shared. So uh, regardless of whether their provider, you know, if their provider puts information in, that's not part of consent. That, that's upstream of that. Okay, so that clarifies. So but which providers are offering mm -hmm. opt-out? So, so all, of the all of the providers in the health information exchange at this point are in an opt-out status. On March 1st, uh, sorry, an opt-in an opt status. On March 1st, they will be moving to opt-out. Um, and that is across the board. Providers may choose to put their health information into the health information exchange based on their technical capabilities of their electronic medical record. It's not related to opt-in or opt-out. Okay, that helps and then the one I was actually after, after the clarification, is if a person decides to opt out, what kind of guidance do they get, what that is like to navigate the mm -hmm. healthcare system when they, if they opt out, and the other one would be quickly, in terms of educating them, can you do a TED talk where they might be able to pick what language they hear it in with sort of universal graphics that also send the 
message in terms of, well, I need to know that one. Yeah. The, the, the TED Talk is an interesting strategy. We will definitely put that down on our, on our list of, of things, um, things to uh, consider. Um, you, what you bring up is the core of what we're trying to achieve, which is meaningful consent. Um, the, the stakeholder process that we've outlined today is really designed to um, identify how people prefer to receive their information through their healthcare provider online, um, how they prefer to receive it, and what messages uh, they feel like will adequately represent um, what, what uh, consent means. Um, and so we're working through that process now of developing that so people do understand um, what it means if they, choose to opt, if they choose to allow their information to continue to be shared or they choose to um, opt out. Um, and so that, that's currently under development. Thank you. Yep. Other questions or comments from the public? Do you see anybody? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, I want to thank oh, you. Susan, yes. Oh, did you? Sure, after I turned my head. <laughs> I just had a comment, which is that I was present um, when Maureen met with a number of people with intellectual disabilities and parents of um, children with disabilities and complex medical needs. and. You know, as you guys know, I'm a recovering lawyer and I've been doing health care law and law with dis people with disabilities and dealing with consent for more than 20 years, I hate to say it. And uh, Maureen, your presentation with the patients and the exes and Dr. One, Dr. Two, Dr. Three is one of the best pieces I've seen and I can't wait to see more. And hopefully, feel something. But your ability to explain these complex concepts to people with visuals to get to uh, members' public questions, one of you guys asked questions about visuals, was so effective. And every single person in that focus group participated, and they participated like in their own way, in their own level, but you made that possible, so kudos. Thank you so much. High praise. Other questions before I thank this excellent panel? Um, you know, proof will be in the pudding, but it looks like uh, this is off to a great start as far as uh, a solid implementation plan. So thank you. I know this is a lot of hard work, and you have been given a very high bar to achieve. So thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you for having thank us. You. At this point, we're going to take a short break. Um, we will reconvene at 2.45, and if... Sarah and Michelle can be ready to go promptly. That would be super. And whenever the two of you are ready, go ahead. Is it right next? Oh, do you want to show me the phone? Somebody did. Okay, awesome. Uh, so Sarah and I are here to talk to you today um, pretty briefly about some of the performance year one quality scale and total cost of care results to date is like the key phrase there. This is obviously not final as of yet, so we're just going to walk through some of the information that we do have access to um, and uh, give some more background on where we hope to end by uh, the end of this coming year. So I'm going to kick us off and talk about some of the statewide health outcomes and quality of care results. Um, just a quick refresh, it's been a while probably since we've looked at this slide um, on the quality framework before we dig into some of the results. So as you're all very well aware by now, I'm probably sick of listening to me talk about this, uh, Vermont is responsible for meeting quality targets um, on 20 measures under the model and they fall into three buckets. We've got process milestones, so those ensure that the state and the ACO are striving towards improvement on quality and population health. We have healthcare delivery system targets. And those are measures and targets that evaluate ACO performance and quality of care. So for these measures, the population is people attributed to the ACO, and these measures can be multi-payer or payer specific. And then lastly, we've got our population health outcomes. These are statewide measures and targets related to the health of the population, regardless of whether this population seeks care or not. Um, pop, so the population here generally includes all Vermonters, 
And um, something that I, I like to point out is that these measures are unique to Vermont's model. We're one of the first initiatives to commit to these big kind of statewide health improvement goals as part of a major delivery system and payment reform model. Um, each of the process milestones and healthcare delivery systems targets support the achievement of one of the statewide population health outcomes, hence the lovely triangle. So, what looks so tiny? Um, I want to sort of preface this with a reminder that our first annual report will be released later this year and we'll have complete 2018 quality and health outcomes results at that time. I'm only presenting results today for those measures that we currently have data on, so you will not see all 20 all-payer model measures represented here. Um, so a quick touch on the, the behavioral risk factor surveillance system. So again, this is conducted among all Vermont's um, age 18 or older, and uh, you have to be a, a Vermont resident for 30 or more days out of the year. Um, and Vermont's average survey group is between six and 7,000 people annually. Um, so if you look, we don't quite have the 2018 results yet. They become available towards the end of September or early October. Um, again, that's a CDC-run survey, so by the time our health department gets the results, we typically can get information from them before the final report is released by the department, but that's not something that we want to present before they do. So um, here we're just looking at the 2017 data that we have. And if you look at that, um, as you can see, we're currently on track to meet all of our performance year five targets based on the 2017 information. Um, in terms of vital statistics measures, um, I just want to make a note that even though I said our first annual report will have 2018 data, um, vital stats measures are at least one, if not two or more calendar years behind. And so for each annual report produced, we won't actually be reporting on the mortality of that prior performance year. It will be whatever performance year is most current um, and the performance period will be in alignment with that calendar year. Um, but it will be, again, the most current information that we have from vital statistics at the time that the report is produced. So just something to keep in mind as these results continue to be updated. No? There we go. Um, so we'll look at some of the uh, other measures here. So we have the Vermont Uniform Hospital Discharge Data System measure. Um, this measure, again, had a phased approach to get to the performance year five target, and we're currently on track. Um, this will be updated with the 2018 discharge data when that annual health outcomes and quality of care report is released. Uh, for the Vermont Prescription Monitoring System, um, use of the VPMS has steadily increased while opioid recipients have decreased, which leads to that quite dramatic increase in the ratio. Ooh. It's it's nice, isn't it? it is nice. <laughs> um, so I, I spoke with our um, colleagues over at the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Programs um, Department at the Health Department to just kind of get some background on this. And they had stated that some of the drivers here are those new pain rules that were instituted through the legislature um, and VPMS system enhancements that include things like prescriber insight reports and clinical alerts. Um, in addition to education and training opportunities for prescribers. And then there's also been some media and education outreach for the general public that could uh, factor into this quite significant progress. Again, this is really good for one year, but our target is still for performance year five, so we don't want to see this go down. <laughs> um, for the hub and spoke information here, um, we're doing quite well. Uh, so we're surpassing the target that was set, which was the 150. So we're more in line with this quote unquote rate of demand measure here, which will be hard to ultimately measure the rate of demand. Um, so we're, we're looking good there, I'll just say that. Um, and for the ACO line beneficiaries, this comes straight from our scale target report that was produced earlier this year. Sarah will talk more about the scale report earlier this year. It was in June. Um, and Sarah will talk a little bit more about the scale report. I do want to touch briefly on some potential quality framework technical changes. So we've been in contact with our federal partners regarding these technical changes to the framework. This will not change any of the 20 measures included. Rather, it's an effort for all of us to better align the performance year targets 
performance year five targets with available data sources and timing of the report to this data availability. Um, so I just kind of wanted to touch on that, that those conversations are currently underway. Do you want to ask me questions first or do you want to wait until the end? I think we can wait till the end. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so we just submitted our uh, Q3 2018 uh, financial monitoring report to the federal government. There's a lengthy lag on these results due to claims run out and waiting for some complete data. Uh, we do expect lengthier delays for our initial Q4 report. Um, we've had some challenges in getting data from some of our payers into vCures, and so uh, you know we'll we'll deal with that challenge. Uh, but just giving you a heads up, um, we also now will be producing a final annual report with six months of claims run out. Um, which means that uh, we'll be rerunning our baseline information to account for that. Um, but all that is to say that these results are <laughs> going to change, but this is the best guess we have for how we're doing so far. So um, the all-payer total cost of care is something that we're bound to try to limit the average annual growth to 3.5% or less between 2017 and 2022. We like to see how we're doing and whether or not we're quote unquote on track in the meantime. This is all Vermonters, whether or not they're attributed to the ACO, um, as long as we have their information in VCURES. So again, we're missing a goodly portion of our uh, self-funded plans uh, that have access to uh, an exemption and don't have to give their claims. So on the top here, we have the quarterly um, per member per month costs and the year to date. So that's Q1 through Q3 um, for the baseline year. Again, we're going to rerun that with um, th six months of run out. So that'll probably go up a bit when we do that. And then we have uh, the 2018 results to date. Now you'll note that this number um, is pretty low and that is deceptive. So that's only with three months of claims run out. So that number also will go up. So we have a year over growth of 5.5% in Q1, 5% even in Q2, and that 1.7 in Q3 is a number that we know will increase. Um, but the year to date results um, are sitting at 4.1. This number is clearly above 3.5, uh, but not above the corrective action trigger of 4.3%. <coughs> we, um, we were from a lot of things all at the same time in Vermont. And so it's come to our attention that some really exciting and important work that, are, that is being conducted by our partners at Medicaid may be affecting the claims as we see them in VCURES. So it's hard to know how, how much these numbers are going to change due to the baseline changing. And also, we know that the growth rate we're seeing for Medicaid is too high um, for what should be included in the total cost of care. So we need to do a real deep dive on our code to get that right. Um, so I don't think that um, we're probably really at 4.1%, but it's hard for me to estimate exactly how much lower it might be. I will tell you that these numbers also take into account the Section 10D of the agreement, the so-called hold harmless provision. And that one is the one that says, if you're increasing Medicaid reimbursement in order to get it closer to Medicare, we're, we're going to give you a break on that. And so that um, ended up docking this uh, percentage uh, down by 0.4 percentage points, or about $8.3 million. So uh, that is a combination of two different adjustments. For our claims-based measures, we asked our partners, and they generously complied to reprice the 2018 claims as if it were 2017 without those price increases that the federal government said, yeah, we buy that. That's getting you closer to Medicare or improving access. And then we also did an adjustment to the non-claims-based portion of 4.2%. The reason we're using that number and, and we need to make sure that that's the right number is that since we're using the actual capitated amount in our total cost of care, that means that we're not counting the savings or losses or don't, we don't have the luxury of that offset. So we want to make sure that any assumptions that went into building that capitated rate are reflected here. So that's our best guess today about what they built into the 2018 capitated rate 
for these pricing increases, the major one being Dartmouth. Yeah, all right, <laughs> next slide. <laughs> So, um, so these things evolve over time. So the way to read this, so here's the payer group, and then the rows um, represent previous quarterly reports, and then the columns are the estimate for that. So for instance, the all payer rate for the Q1 report we thought was 2.1, that jumped to 4.0 in the Q2 report and is now at 5.5. So these things increase with more run out. Um, this again, this negative 1.5 going up to 5.7 in negative 4 to 4.2, this is more evidence that something wonky is going on with our Medicaid data that we need to sort out. So um, we're well aware of that and uh, we'll get that sorted to the best of our abilities before our next report. Um, I know that it's frustrating not to have that information today, but uh, you know, the analogy I keep hearing that feels truer every day is flying a plane while, it, or building a plane while it's being flown. <laughs> but uh, you know, we're, we're sorting this out and we, we're lucky to have great partners both at the state level and at the federal level as we try and sort this out. Um, so yep, this is just the quarterly trend. So just kind of generally the, the what we tend to see is Q1 and 2 um, being, you know, relatively higher a dip in Q3 there tends to be you know less utilization then due to a variety of reasons and then a, and then an uptick in Q4 um, so this Q3 number again is going to go up we think uh, but that's where it stands today um, and this is what it looks like by pair so Medicare is the average cost um, you know per person per month commercial splits the difference with the Medicaid. And again, not only is there an adjustment for the whole harmless provision for Medicaid, but we're only including about half of the Medicaid spend in uh, the total cost of care. It's just funds that flow through DIVA. So there's other services that will be incorporated eventually into the, this measure, but this is just basically claims-based measures that are part of the contract with the One Care Vermont. So totally different numbers. They don't match for a good reason. So in the first few years of the agreement, our Medicare total cost of care is tied to the ACO population. So uh, due to some limitations in data availability, we unfortunately will not be able to get, we don't think, any quarterly estimates um, for the baseline year. And what this is designed to do is say, okay, th this is the population in 2018 who is actually attributed to the ACO. Who would have been attributed in 2017 based on the 2018 provider list? And let's see what their expenses looked like. So that's a cohort over cohort comparison based on the provider list. So it's less about the people and more about the delivery system. I think that's the intent of the way it was drawn up. Um, but um, all that to say, um, you know, this growth rate now says 1.3%, but because we set the benchmark, we know that this growth rate will end up being 3.5%. So we're gonna have the rest of the information trickle in, we're gonna have any shared savings or losses, so we know it's gonna grow by that amount, um, close to it. But this is uh, the best data we have available, and this is the one that's been kind of the trickiest to get at. Uh, so. Fun fact is that you don't have to necessarily live in Vermont to be attributed to the ACO. It's based on where the provider's located. So if you live next door and your provider's in Vermont, you can be attributed. But as of today, we don't have those claims in VCURES. So we're pursuing a different kind of data use agreement that might help with some of those data gaps. But um, one advantage of doing this on kind of a per member per month basis or a per member per year basis is that um, we think a lot of that will come out in the wash and that we don't think that there's a substantial population difference between people coming over the lake. It's mostly the New York area that um, people are, we're in this situation. Um, so yeah, scale. So again, we kind of have like the quality targets, the financial targets, and then we have the access targets. And the best way we can measure that is through how many people are aligned to this ACO. And so it's definitely getting uh, more expanding over time. So the light blue are HSAs that uh, aren't participating, orange is Medicaid only, and uh, the pink is uh, the odd, uh, not odd, but the unique situation we have with Dartmouth where it's Medicaid and Blue Cross only, and then the 
bluish purple, dark, this area, is um, in participating in all programs. So we have more and more kind of growing into this um, darker uh, kind of show of participation in all programs, which um, means scale is increasing as well. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. Oh, it's New Hampshire. I was like, what is that? That's like New Hampshire. I don't know about that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry. So, uh, so as it looks, uh, these again are estimates for the 2019 plan year um, or calendar year. So, you know, Medicaid's got a very healthy penetration rate. Uh, met in that might is that low? I feel like I, this is an old slide, so it may not be quite up to date. But um, the major message still is that. We have much uh, greater penetration by the governmental payers and that the real room to grow is among the commercial market. And so uh, we are hoping to see major gains in this area in 2020. Um, and that is also, this one in particular, you can see how high it is and it's the one where the um, regulatory levers for the board um, are maybe most restricted if you think about the um, rate review portion. So um, getting this, more of this bar, a lighter uh, green, would help maybe increase the strength of a lever in that particular market. All right, am I supposed to be talking about this or you? Okay, great. <laughs> um, so yeah, so as far as the targets go, so um, the for Medicare, I always have a hard time reading this. So the target in performance year one was sixty percent in. 2019 at 75%. Uh, we're still below our targets, but gaining. Um, and we've also had some really encouraging progress with our federal partners because when we've started to look into the data, if you say, okay, how many Vermont residents would even attribute to a Vermont provider if every single Vermont provider were participating in the ACO? And spoiler alert, it's less than 80%. And that's because of either being attributed to a provider that's in another state because they didn't have any um, qualified evaluation and management services. So that might be they didn't seek any care or they're like so sick that the type of care they're receiving isn't really typical primary care um, and stuff like that. So they're um, aware. Unfortunately, they're not very nimble. So changing the um, alignment strategy is not something that we can do quickly, but that we're starting that process to figure out you know, what a fair target might be and maybe, maybe there's a split between who we count for scale and who counts for the total cost of care or something like that. So we're just starting to kind of explore these questions, but um, it, it was really encouraging that they kind of heard that message loud and clear because we, we want to want to be ambitious but fair in our goals. Um, for all payer, it was 22% uh, was the performance, based on, uh, which is below our target of 36%. Um, we're still waiting on some final information in the current performance year, and we get to count any programs that come online through the course of the year. So it looks like we'll probably fall short of that 50%, but again, we're making gains and kind of closing that gap. Uh, for 2020, the increase for Medicare is a little less dramatic than it was between perf performance years one and two, so it's kind of nice and that would be true for the all payer as well so um, that'll be a nice kind of chance to hopefully gain some ground a slide you're all familiar with uh, this outlines the reports that were responsible for submitting to cmmi through the duration of the agreement my favorite data point for you all is uh let's see 39 to go 30, sure. 39 more between now and the end of 2023 because it ends in 2022, takes about a year to finalize all these things. Um, so you'll notice that year two, which is where we are now, is a big year for all of the analytics and reporting activities. So you'll be seeing a lot more of Sarah and myself uh, with a number of recur recurring reports that have started this year. So on this slide, we've only listed them at their outset. Sarah talked about total cost of care, and she did reference that we are also adding an annual report to sort of account for six months of run out to hopefully get a little bit better of a picture. So that added five more reports to the total number of reports. Um, 
We've got payer differential reporting. Um, we had our first scale and alignment report that came out in June, and our first quality report is due later this year, as I mentioned. In addition, we'll produce a handful of one-off reports on particular topics. So we've got um, different aspects of pair differential analysis that you can see up there. There's a pair differential options report in performance year three. Um, we have a public health system accountability framework that is led by the agency. And we also have a plan to integrate mental health, substance use, and home and community-based services within the all-payer financial target services. And again, that's led by the Agency of Human Services. 39 more. <laughs> that's it for us. But who's counting, right? Okay. Me. <laughs> Questions? I just wanted to say thank you, Sarah, for explaining both some of the data issues that uh, I wish I had known during the negotiation, but didn't, <laughs> uh, including the Medicare uh, attribution challenges, because that was definitely something that was not on the radar. So we're learning a lot, and I think that's good, even though it uh, does make the reports challenging to both do and understand as we move forward. But thank you for explaining that as we went along. Um, I just have a question on, um, if you can go back to page nine. Um, and what, I guess, what our level of concern should be when you look across the top on the all, and we're at the 4.1, and I think you said 4.3 is when things could kick in. And, you know, Q1 through Q2, obviously we're exceeding that. Q3, if we look back at the past two quarters, we would expect a pretty significant jump to where Q3 ends up. So the point is we're, we're tracking, you know, above that. And I know there's some issues with the Medicaid data that might be artificially inflating that, but I guess what's our level of concern? What happens if we trigger, you know, because if we, if we were just through the first two quarters, we'd be averaging, you know, five, five and a quarter, so we'd be a point above. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's hard to say exactly. So a corrective action plan isn't like an automatic thing. Like it's something the federal government, I think, according to the agreement, may request. And so what that would look like, I think, would be, you know, a partnership and trying to figure out exactly what uh, what that would look like. But I, I yeah, I wouldn't. It's, it's just so hard to say. This five seven is just not right like that, that then that's a big number to not have right so mm -hmm. um yeah so i guess i just i'm not sure and i i hope we can get this straightened out um you know as soon as possible so that we can have a better kind of litmus test for exactly where we're at and how concerned we should be and um yeah i mean yeah. Yeah. and even without the issues with medicaid commercial and medicare through the first six months sure are exceeding the 4.3. Oh, so, yeah. 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 And like the other thing, like our spending can be a little bit noisy. So, you know, this is like a five year target. And so not being on track doesn't mean every, it's all doom and gloom. But um, yeah, no, it's I definitely don't want to fall too far behind and get ourselves in real trouble. So, yeah, I, I, I would say it's a concern. But how serious of a concern, I, I just, I'm just not sure at this point. Okay. Yeah. Can I also <laughs> jump in on that because I think. Um, Given the scale, it's not particularly surprising that when we're looking at spending, which includes a majority of fee-for-service, that it would come close to or even exceed the 4.3. Because while there's been a lot of focus on the 3.5, the 4.3 in and of itself was a stretch goal, yeah. given that that was also tied to the economy. And healthcare spending, as we know, traditionally grows faster than the economy. So Yeah, one solid recession is going to bail us out. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, I think to me, these numbers, again, recognizing that there's a lot of noise in them right now and we don't actually know what the right number is, um, given how much is still in fee-for-service is not particularly surprising. Sarah, can you just remind me again, I think you said, but when you think this chart will be I, I updated. I'm really hoping <laughs> that we can get this right for the Q4 report, um, but when the Q4 report will be possible is, is uncertain due to until we get the claims that we need, we can't get an extract or run any of this stuff. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. 
yeah, and even when we get that data, I mean, the commercial stuff might be a little dicey, um, but yeah, it'll be much, I think it'll be in a much better shape than it is right now. Yeah. Other questions? If not, we'll open it up to the public for any comments or questions. Dale. How many quarters do I need before I can really determine noise versus trend? And then part of the reason I'm asking that is if you go to the map with all the nice colors on it, does that actually reflect that noise? Oh, sure. So um, the all pair, these guys, it's the whole map. Doesn't matter. Yeah, so that, that part. But th that said, you know, we are a relatively small state. And so, you know, sometimes noise is the trend. <laughs> you know, when you're in a small, it's like it, it is the value we have, but it can vary a lot year over year. So in, in terms of being um, relatively confident in the number that we have for that time period, we like to see six months of claim, claims run out. And then it takes us about another three months to actually get that data in-house. So nine months. Okay, so that's part of what confuses me sometimes because if I'm in California and see a ship like this, compared to the magnitude of what I'm dealing with, I'm stable. I'm here in Vermont where I don't even qualify maybe as a, a town over there. And <laughs> is it more almost you've got an exaggeration? Yeah. It would be the best town, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Once we get this right, it, uh, you know, the plan is to get a historical quarterly trend, and at least we could get, like, an average with a confidence interval to be like, okay, well, what is the average magnitude of change we would expect um, on a quarterly basis? And, you know, I think that would help put some guardrails around kind of the concern issue and figure out, like, what our kind of effect size is for... Um, Worry. <laughs> well, this is also why it's a five year trend and not a year to year trend. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, Walter. Pick up on a little bit what Dale said. I'm just curious what all these numbers mean for the quality of care. You know, we're talking about PCOC, but people still get claim denials. You know, they, they still have troubles with bills, they still have problems with providers and everything. And I hear about it every day. So I just, you know, these are great for measuring this or that, but they're not measuring the human value to it. Yeah, and um, we're actually actively working on trying to help tease out some utilization data, which still isn't going to be perfect for quality, but at least you can see if. Um, and, and one thing that we, we don't have a great control group to compare these attributed lives to. So because, you know, look at how much is in here and, and finding even another state with a similar regulatory environment and situation is, is pretty tough to do. So um, one thing we can, we're trying to think through it, are ways to say, okay, so let's look at the ACO population before they were attributed and see how different they look from the population that wasn't attributed and then let's kind of track those two groups over time um, to see if we're seeing changes in their primary care utilizations, access to specialists, things like that. So um, on top of that, we have the quality-based measures, some of which are just tied to the ACO population. Um, but I do, I do think that, yeah, the triple aim is, is a heck of an optimization problem. Like, it, it, it's, and, and quality in particular is a very hard thing to measure. Other questions or comments? Susan. Um, hi. So I've been having a hard time um, squaring today's materials with some of the numbers that were in the report dated in June 29th, um, the first scale trigger report. That report itself had no internal inconsistencies, that there were three or four different numbers for um, the total number of lives <coughs> attributed in 2018. So like specifically referring to the other report, the um, scale targets have two different numbers. Uh, one, 112 in one instance, 112,756 in one instance, and 109,728 in another instance. And then in this report, you're not using numbers, you're using like percentages. So I'm just wondering if I write you an email, could you help me square some of these numbers? 
I, I don't know how when you go from a whole number to a percent, if you're using two different whole numbers, it seems like the percents will change too. So, can you clarify? Yeah, I, so uh, I've, I've been alerted to some some differences in the numbers, and sometimes it depends on whether, so attribution occurs before the performance year begins, and between when that happens and when the performance year starts, um, we lose some folks, uh, particularly with Medicare, they die or sign up for Medicare Advantage and stuff like that, so um, can certainly uh, review the report. Um, I don't know how soon, <laughs> but um, yeah, we can certainly um, try to sort that. Okay, other questions or comments? Yes, Susan. Yes. So I had noticed that in um, July there had been a schedule, a presentation scheduled, I think it was for like that July 17th meeting that was going to be on an all payer model update. Then there was another presentation scheduled for your meeting next week. I was working at the council. My understanding is that we won't have Medicare information until September. But I'm asking now, I'll ask you, uh, Mr. Chair, can the Green Mountain Care Board? have a presentation in September that has the quality and financial performance for the three major payers, Medicare, Medicaid, and Blue Cross. Um, in this year-to-year -year data sets that we're used to looking at, the quality and performance measures, the you know, targeted total cost of care, the actual total cost of care. Because what seems to be happening now is we're getting reports that sort of year time periods, like quarter three, but I don't see the Green Mountain Care Board actually scheduling a time to really look at what is the ACO to get at um, Walter's question. We have information on quality. I mean, the Medicaid program is collecting information on quality on a whole bunch of points. So probably, too, is we Cross, and so is Medicare. So it would be really nice to, to see those. In addition to the other stuff you're doing, which I understand are the quality measures for the all-payer model, but the quality measures by payer and the financial performance by payer year over year is really important information. And I feel like we're losing it. And we're losing the ability to track it in part because the numbers are changing, but we're also losing it because the presentation of the graphs and the information is changing. So, so I guess my answer would be we might, but it will depend upon the delivery of information from others then even though information is promised, it does not always arrive on time. Kevin, may I add to that? Sure. Um, so as part of the ACO budget guidance this year, we did ask them to address through their payer contract. So again, some of those measures do align with the measures that the state is responsible for through the agreement, but they have varying measures through their payer contracts. Um, assuming that settlement has occurred by the time they come to present on their budget, we have asked them to include that information. Um, so you would see that through the ACO budget process in the fall, in October. And that's great, but that process doesn't allow for an actual review by the board of that information and an explanation, why did you only get a zero for follow-up for substance use disorder, you know, what is your quality improvement plan for that measure, that kind of presentation, which I think would be really vital to the success of this project. So I think that will be part of this year's process because in prior years for the, that will be what I do, I think, through this year's um, ACO guidance process and er, budget process. And so in years past, you know, we could have referenced shared savings programs me measures um, and their performance there. But as we try to sort of tease these things apart, the ACO has payer contracts and we want to start following the performance on those payer contracts from year to year, recognizing that they may negotiate new measure sets as they move forward. And, and that's, that's part of the deal. Um, but so that will be part of the question very likely part of the questions that the staff will have back to the ACO that we will present publicly and that the ACO will likely respond to in a public manner or all of that documentation will at least be um, available on our website. Other questions? Okay. Um, so we have had now two years with Medicaid, but we have not had a chance to analyze and finalize our first year with commercial and our first year with Medicare. 
So it's not possible at this point to do a lot of year-over-year -year analysis because we don't even have our first year of data yet. So that was the only thing I would add in there. But yes, Michelle's also correct that that's coming as part of the, the ACO budget review process this year because we have the opportunity to do that and the data to do that. And I believe you're making a distinction between a first year and a second year of health care model. I believe the way the budget guidance is worded is that information is being asked for from all payers, from all ACO contracts going forward. So the shared saving contract with Medicare that you know, have to have about five or six years and with and with the cost and with the state prior to the next one. Should all those quality forms have really haven't changed that much in those programs. So being able to look year over year at those measures, just because it's now called all payer, the population hasn't changed, the measures haven't changed, the payers haven't changed, the one care hasn't changed, just the name of the program has changed. I don't agree, Susan. I think the providers have changed, the population has changed, the payment mechanism has changed, which will have an impact. So I don't see the programs as comparable. That's my personal view. The population. All right. Well, well I really hope that the Greenland Care Board does its job and allows a good evaluation of the effectiveness of the saving money as an improving quality, if not, what's the thing? We will do our best. Any other public comments or questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Um, is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. We've moved and second to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of the day.